You're listening to the Straits of Video Podcast with Rob Lane. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you're listening, and thanks for checking out my Straight to Video podcast. Hope this finds you well with whatever you're doing, and as ever, I'm looking forward to bringing you another fun talk on this show. So on today's episode, I speak with guitarist Keith Atak, the mastermind behind the new band that takes his surname, and they've just released their debut album, Nine Lives, through Escape Music. And for fans of classic hard rock, such as Bad Company, Deep Purple, and that true British rock and roll sound, then you're gonna love this release. Now, whilst Atak may be considered a new band, Keith's professional music career now spans six decades, beginning in the 70s having success with the band Child, before heading out as a much in-demand session and touring player for the likes of Bonnie Tyler and David Cassidy to name but a few. Today though, Keith is all about showcasing his own material with ATAC, so we discuss the new album, along with many stories of growing up in the 70s, his relationship with his twin brother Tim and their early chart success. As always, this Straight to Video podcast is proudly presented to you in association with Affinity Photo, an incredible piece of photo editing software which I use all the time for graphic design. It's used to create the podcast episode artwork you see each week and it's an extremely affordable alternative to other programs on the market. So please, if you can, check them out at affinity.serif.com. All right, the new album Nine Lives from Keith and his band ATAC is out now through Escape Music and the band are playing their debut headline show at the Patriot in Crumley on May the 24th, followed by an appearance at the Tower of Fire Festival in Manchester on Saturday the 29th of June. And all info can be found at atacband.com. But right now, please enjoy my straight-to-video chat with Keith Atac. How you? How's it going? All right, thanks. Yeah, good. Great stuff. Whereabouts are you? Near Leeds in Yorkshire. Okay, cool. Where are you? I'm like right in between Nottingham and Derby, so not too far away. Just down the M1. <laughs> I play at a club in Sutton in Ashfield. It's no near there, is it? The Diamond? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I had my uh, had my 40th birthday there. Yeah. <laughs> Great place, that is. Great, yeah. Who have you played there with? I play with some tribute stuff. Oh, yeah. It's a big tribute venue there. Yeah, I get roped in to play with all loads of different things. It's the supermarket run for me, you know, pays the bills. It's kind of weird, though, doing the tribute thing. Like yourself, done original music for years, and then just to do tribute stuff and have people react instantly to it, it's a weird detachment, I think. Yeah, the moment I play guitar in a Genesis, Phil Collins, that's the one we do quite a bit of the time, and we're just starting a tour. What's that called? It's called Seriously Collins. Oh, nice. There's some bangers in that set then. Oh, some great ones. I like it because he's added a lot more Genesis stuff. Invisible Touch, it's probably my top 10 of all time pop songs. Yeah. I love it. I love it. Keith, your career, it's spanned many, many decades. Great to see you back out there with the new ATAC album, Nine Lives, which it's a real classic rock tour de force. I read lots of comparisons to bands like Deep Purple and Rainbow, but there's so many other elements on show. My ears immediately gravitated to like a Bad Company, Paul Rogers vibe. Perhaps that's due to Lee Smalls' vocals. I think so, yeah. That's why I love Lee's voice, because I like that soul. They are who they are individually, but Paul Rogers is probably my favourite British singer, and I think it leans more towards that. I don't write it that way. It's just with Lee's style. Very Glenn Hughes as well. I think that's why you get the deep purple kind of comparisons. The construction of the tracks as well. Again, it's not like I set out to mimic another band. It's just, you know, I mean, I love Uriah Heap too. They're a great band. I like Michael Schenker group and Scorpions and things, you know. So I like that big sound. But Lee definitely gives it that Glenn Hughes and Paul Rogers slant. How far down like the songwriting process do you get before you present it either to go into the studio and stuff? Is it just basic guitar and vocal? I get quite a way down, really. This project came together, really. Initially, in lockdown, I was writing. I had the time then to stay at home and write rather than be on the road doing different things. 
I naturally write, because as a guitar player, I write rock music. And I was just singing the demos myself at the time. I mean, I'm not a bad singer, but I thought, well, to really, really do this properly, I'd like to replace my vocal with, with like, find the best singer I can. You think, like, if I get somebody else in, it will take it up to that next level. You're not precious. No, not at all. No, I mean, I didn't want to have my own hard work by sticking just my own voice on it. What I did realise very quickly was when you talk about how prepared the songs are, I realised when Lee Small started singing the songs, I wasn't going to be able to just throw a song at him and ask him to almost do a cover of it. I realised when he was doing my vocal lines, he was singing it unnatural to him. So I stripped that out and then said to him, look, you do what you feel you would do on this. Use what I give you as a guide. You know, it would come back surprisingly different from what I do, but in a good way. He actually improved the songs. Are there any tracks you're particularly proud of? Funnily enough, I'm proud of the album as a whole. One thing, again, what I didn't want to do was I didn't want to have maybe three or four really good tracks on the album and then have fillers, you know, and I just certainly didn't want any covers. And I realised, though, like a lot of people, when in the prospect of making an album, you realise that you've probably got to write at least 20 songs to get 10 or 11. So I'd got Nine Lives, the actual track, and I'd got My New Addiction. They're the two I'm really proud of because they were the first two. They were like kind of kicked it into gear for you. Yeah, they created the spark for me, really. So I'm really proud of those songs. My first challenge was to make sure all the tracks were as strong as those two. So they were like the benchmark. This is the bar, if it's not as good as them. (laughs) Yeah, exactly, yeah. I didn't even set out for it to be like a classic rock sound. I had an open mind about that. I just wanted to create a sound. It's evolved quite naturally, that. I certainly didn't go, well, let's try to recreate the sound of Deep Purple or Rainbow. or It just comes out that way. You know, I play a Fender Stratocaster, for instance. I don't play a Les Paul to a modern high-gain amplifier. It is a really big, fat guitar sound you've got on the album. Straight away, it's like, dang. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a Strat, though. I didn't use a Les Paul or anything like that. It's more natural for me to play a Fender Stratocaster. It's just that sound. I don't like the guitar to be too sustained, and I like the power chords sound a little bit gnarly like they do on a Strat. I think a Strat and the Hammond organ mix brilliantly because the Hammond organ is actually the thing that breaks up more than the guitar, whereas a lot of bands, it's the Les Paul that breaks everything. It seems to be perfect timing for the kind of music that's on Nine Lives. There's a lot of younger bands doing similar kind of styles as well, so it's just going to slot right in with everything. Yeah, it's great timing. I mean, you know, it's a good point, that, because people often say to me, why didn't you do this before? You know, why didn't you do this years ago? And I, and I think, well, the climate wasn't right. It's really weird. You can't force the climate. You've got to wait for it to come round, really. As you brother tim given much feedback on the album as he's someone who you've worked and collaborated with closely in various guises over the years and he continues to be like a powerhouse in the industry yeah he does yeah he's right no he loves the album in fact he helped me with some of the early kind of mixes when i was putting things together but we very much work very separately now i'll dip in and do an odd session for him or something like that but he writes for netflix now and he writes you know, a lot of the documentaries you see on Netflix. He just did the Wham documentary, right? He did the Wham documentary, he did Hillsborough. He's just finished one on Lockerbie. He did the George Best one. You know, he's like he's never stopped working, really. But that's a million miles away from this. Tim is actually your twin brother. Um, you're born in Wakefield, I believe. Yes, yeah. Yeah, is that where you grew up? Near Wakefield, yeah, Pontefract. I moved south, actually. In my early 20s, I moved south, had my family down there, but I've actually just moved back now. What I love about being in the North is the pub bands. There's still a great environment for rock bands in the clubs and the pubs, which I still love. I mean, I we grew up going to see bands in pubs. That was the starting point. I always tell people, like, when I first started getting into live music, I'd see these guys playing these bands, and they were probably just a guy who lived three or four miles away from me, but I was like, this is a guy in a band. I was like, totally, not necessarily starstruck, but I'm like, holy crap, who's this guy here? Yeah, I was, yeah. Well, I worked with a fair amount with John Parr, you know, that did some Telmo's Fire. Another northern legend, sir. Yeah, 
I still work with him on stuff. You know, he's doing an album at the moment, which is great. And I've written some of the stuff on that with him. But my first experience with him was he was playing in a band in Yorkshire called Bittersweet. And I used to go and see him. He's a couple of years, a few years older than me. And he, he was like a really great guitar player. You know, they always get like somebody who carves a reputation in the pubs and the clubs local. And he was he was that guy, you know. How long after was it that you got to work with him? Did you tell him that story that you used to go and watch him? Oh, yeah, yeah. It was only these last sort of few years that I started working with him. Did you have like a million relatable things, cross paths? Yeah, near cross paths, yeah, because, you know, he did a lot of work with Tina Turner. I did a lot of work with Bonnie Tyler, and he did quite a bit with Meatloaf. So we're kind of similar backgrounds in that respect. Very cool. Being from the north, I mean, I'm from the Midlands and like the Yorkshire areas, pretty old school working class. How was that for you and your brother wanting to be musicians or rock stars? How was that looked upon as you both had that drive and determination from a very young age? Was it like, oh, you got to get a proper job, lad? <laughs> no, I never had a proper job. Well, actually, we did have one job. We worked in a supermarket after school, but there was only one vacancy. So we, we actually shared it. <laughs> did they know that? <laughs> no. They never found out, no. Oh, amazing. <laughs> yeah, and it was literally, I remember buying my first Marshall amplifier with the money I used to get working as a kid in the supermarket. Was it like, oh, I can't be asked to go tonight, you do this shift? Yeah, yeah, well, we literally went alternate days because he was a drummer and he, you know, we, were, we wanted to buy stuff. Was there an advantage to having like a music-loving brother when it came to buying albums? Could you like both get a different album and each and swap them? Well, yeah, and we have an older brother who's an aviation artist, actually, and he's a really great painter, Simon Atak, and he was a great album collector. What's the age difference? I was only 18 months. Okay. But yeah, Simon was a great album collector. He'd always come back, you know, with Yes songs and ELP and he'd always come back with albums every weekend. And I think he used to have like parts on John and he'd just spend all his money on albums. But I think most of what we listened to was stuff Simon was buying. Where was your local record store in Pontefract? Oh, it was this place called The Kiosk across the road from the bus station. And in fact, they still got the shop from there. Obviously, it isn't open now, but it closed so many years ago, but they've never taken the sign down. So it's still like a blast from the past. That's an album cover there for you, Keith, or a single cover. Actually, that's a great idea, yeah. She's in the right kind of area as well, yeah. I'm going to nick that. There you go, you can have that one. Tim began playing drums and you on guitar, which you'd later change to bass in the early lineup of the band that would become Child. Yeah. Did I read you answered an ad in the Yorkshire Evening Post asking, I love this, asking for a band that must look as good as they sound? That's true, yeah. Well, it was our singer's dad, must look as good as they sound, yeah. Which wasn't hard because we didn't sound very good. <laughs> oh, man. So, you know, when we were really young, you know, we were like, 12, 13, you know, we were lucky that we actually got onto the band thing really young. And it's funny because we never wanted to be like a pop band. We were really pushed that way because of our age. So, yeah, I mean, we wanted to be on the old Grey Whistle test. We didn't want to be on top of the pops. But we, we ended up that way anyway, which is great in the end. How was it first coming down to London? Because, like, you guys played the marquee when you was, what, 15, 16? Yeah, well, I was 15. 15? 15, yeah. Weird, yeah. Was that terrifying or like, yes, this is amazing? Well, in a way, but at that age, nothing really terrifies you, does it? You're almost too young to be nervous. But I remember I used to love reading like enemy and sounds and there was always bands photographed at the marquee with the logo in the background. There was a backdrop with the marquee logo on, wasn't there? And I remember the first time I saw that, it hit home then, you know. How did you first get down to London? Was you in a van? Did you go on the train? No, we had our manager then, who was the guy who advertised in the Evening Post. We had him. We, I think we then we'd probably be hiring vans going down the motorway. I don't even remember rehearsing or anything. <laughs> And I'll tell you what it was. We supported, obviously, we weren't headlining, but we supported Ashton Gardner and Dyke. Tony Ashton, he was a friend of John Lord's, and I think Lazy was written about it. Oh, wow. What did they make of you like when you rocked up, all these young kids? <laughs> Absolutely no idea, because we must have looked really young, you know. The band got signed in 76, I believe, but it'd be a few years before you managed to crack the charts. How were those first few years for Child? Was it hard work, or was it a tough slog, or was you just enjoying being in a band? No, it was quite a slog, but again, we were just enjoying it. We had a manager who looked after it. We, we always 
had hotels. But it was, it was slogging up and down. And it was weird days because even before we had a hit record, we could fill top rank suites, for instance. I remember looking and seeing the queue for them wanting to get in. And I thought, I don't know where these people have come from. It was just strange. It seemed to go from nothing to that. And this was quite a bit before we'd had a hit record. You know, we'd be doing top rank suites in Sheffield and places like that. And they'd be really rammed with kids, you know. Someone was working the promotion well then. Yeah, I don't know. It, it was strange. It was quite weird to walk out and be like really random with people, you know. I had no idea what had happened. Because you were doing all like, there's like loads of clips on YouTube of you doing like all the national TV shows. There's clips on the Basil Brush show. Cheggers plays pop. Of course, Top of the Pops. How was your Top of the Pops experience? Well, obviously that was the holy grail. I can never forget the first time we got the call so we got Top of the Pops. It was quite a unique thing. And in those days, that was pretty much the only pop show on TV. It was pretty much watched by everybody. Was it still on Thursday nights in the 70s? Thursday nights, yeah, about half seven or something. And it just, again, because of how popular that was, you went from being unknown to being recognised wherever you went the next day. Top of the Pops was kind of genius back then because I say it was the show that everybody watched. It was a Thursday night, so all the kids were watching it. If they liked something, they'd tell all the mates about it on Friday. Then they'd probably go and buy the single on the Saturday for the chart on Sunday. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. And I remember, I think, to get into the top 50, we'd had a few records out which hadn't done anything. And then we did a cover, When You Walk In The Room. I remember we used to do a lot, like you said, we used to do a lot of slogging around doing radio promotions, record shop PAs, things like that, you know, which were popular. Then the record company would get sales figures every day, you know, in those days. And it was great then, even when the record company said you'd sold, they'd got sales figures for the country, remember? And they'd go, you've got 250 sales today. You go, wow, really? Yeah, and they go, if you keep get up for the next week, you'll probably get a chart place. And then I remember doing Top of the Pops, and it went to 25,000 sales the next day. Holy shit! From 250 to 25,000 in a day. That's how it works. You can't fathom that these days, can you, to think that they were people actually going into a shop? Physically into a shop and handing over money for a, a single. Yeah. <laughs> it's unreal. Yeah. Crazy, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. After Child, you and Tim continued to work together. I think there was a version of ATAC as a duo. There was, very briefly. And again, the reason why we used our surnames, because when we were negotiating for a record deal, we nearly signed to Elton John's label and his manager, John Reed, who ran Rocket Records. They were kind of interested. They weren't interested enough, but they were interested. And he always said, you've got to call yourself Ata. He said, you're very lucky to have a surname like that. To us, it seemed like odd. It seemed like an odd thing because nobody was enamoured by their own surname or anything like that. Either. It's got all the right letters for a cool logo, though. <laughs> well, exactly. It does look good on a, on the logo. So we said, OK. Now, John Reed's partner, a guy called Eric Hall, who was at Rocket Record? He'd previously been at EMI, multi bands like Queen. He was a really big record promoter. He was the head plugger at EMI. He was leaving Rocket Records and forming his own little label. It was like a subsidiary of Decca or something. So we went with him in the end. So our meeting at Rocket Records was the reason why we became ATA, because we went with Eric then. Eric financed the album we did. But again, we were still quite young and he was pushing us very much in the pop direction. Damn you two for being so good looking. <laughs> I didn't want to be that. I wanted to be in a rock band. I wanted to grow me and be in a rock band, really. I didn't want that thing, you know, particularly as the Sex Pistols and The Clash and people like that were like massive then. But the great thing about Eric was he did encourage us to write our own material. He'd gotten us away from doing covers. I think the songs were good, but it was a lesson, a cautionary tale, I think, which made me, again, going back to Lee, cautionary tale was we sang our own songs. And I just thought, well, the songs were good. I just don't think either of us had that real hit voice. People go, well, you can sing, but I know there's a difference. We just didn't have that next level of voice, unfortunately. If I could sing like Lee, you know. That's a voice that, like, makes people stand to attention and wake up. Yeah, God, that's heaven sent now. That's like another league. 
So we did an album, released a couple of singles. We did TV things, you know. We went to Spain and then a couple of different countries doing promos. But obviously the climate, again, just wasn't right. And then, so that was pretty much when Tim and I, actually, no, we had a band called The Duel after that. I tell you something, the video for There's a Living to be Made, it's pure level 42 80s vibes going off. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Now, Tim wrote most of that song. And Tim was very, very into that kind of British Simple Minds Level 42 kind of stuff. So, yeah, we signed to, it was a guy called Buster Pearson who had a label. It was Five Stars, Father. You remember Five Star in the band? So we signed to Buster and it, we went on tour with Five Star. But that was after I'd been playing with Bonnie Tyler and David Cassidy and like doing pop stuff. I mean, the duel, it seemed like it was very much marketed to like your Tears for Fears, Go West, all that kind of thing. Yeah, it was, which was good. That was really more Tim's taste. I was getting into bands like Van Halen and time so i was trying to do all these whammy dive bomb solos and he wasn't letting me do that he was wanting me to play like british guitar which was a lot different to that what was your introduction to van halen it first came to me i was reading an album review of some other band i forget who it was now but they've been slated in this review and he said this band make child sound like van halen that's how slated that band was and i said to who are van halen and then I heard this guitar player, and I'm like, holy shit. That's a great way to be introduced to them, through your own band, in a way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're like saying some other band, they make Child sound like Van Halen. They must have been really, they must have been really soft. Yeah, so I listened to then Eruption and, you know, things like that, oh, like everybody did. I heard Eruption, and it just changed it all for me. I wanted to play crazy guitar solos, and he wanted to do the Tears for Fears approach. Fair enough. Outside of your own band, you became a successful session and touring musician, yeah. even touring with David Cassidy, who you've described as the greatest pop star since Elvis Presley. Yeah. I think Cassidy's achievements perhaps get overlooked in terms of sales and success of how big he was. Yeah, they do. I know there was the Osmonds and there was the Donny Osmond comparison as well. A lot of the girls who I used to talk to those days, they say you were either Donny Osmond or David Cassidy. But I remember all the news footage watching him performing in America. He was creating such hysteria across America as well. Very underrated. How did the two of you hook up? It was luck, really. Again, Tim and I were, we were looking for a publisher at the time. And we went to Brian Morrison and Dick Leahy, who had Bell Records at the time, who Cassidy was on. And Brian Morrison, who published Dark Side of the Moon, and, you know, he was like a giant. He was a real heavyweight, proper cigar smoking, pinstripe suit, <laughs> record executive, you know. And we were in his office. Dick Lee was a legend. He was the first person to record David Cassidy and in his heyday. I think we were playing like you do in publisher's office. And they got David Cassidy over. He got an album called Romance. And he got this single in the charts called The Last Kiss at the time. They said, we've got David Cassidy over here at the moment because he's putting a tour together. And then he came in. He said he was listening to our songs outside and he thought they were great. And he was going, wow, those are these songs, these sound amazing. And, and then we really kind of just met him from that. We really got on well with him. He said, you know, he said, I'm still putting the band together for my tour. I haven't chosen everybody yet. Do you want to come on tour with me? And so he says, absolutely, yeah. One of those like almost sliding door moments if he hadn't been stood outside the room. It was because I met my wife through David Cassidy then. I wouldn't have had the life I had, family life, had I not played with David Cassidy. So it was a real kind of pivotal time. He was a great artist to play with. He was a great singer, and, and he still had that mysterious thing going on. The girls were older by then, but they were still, like, ramming the arenas. I was wondering if, like, the fandom was, like, a whole other level to what you'd seen. Oh, yeah. I mean, we'd seen a lot of hysteria, but we'd seen it, we had to be honest, we'd seen it generally in lower numbers. I mean, there was a couple of places where we played where it was chaos and there was police and dogs and everything like that. But generally speaking, I mean, with him, it was every show he did was sold out. The clips I've seen, it looked pretty much like a rock show as well. Yeah, I mean, you know, he did it the way he did it. and It was pretty much a rock show. I think there's some footage of the Albert Hall shows on YouTube. I mean, yeah, I mean, it was in the days when Mike Mansfield was still directing pop videos and Mike Mansfield spent two days with us at the Albert Hall 
filming the show. And, you know, I think there's a live double album. Having worked in the entertainment industry for so long, how is it for you as a dad when you learned your daughter Emily wanted to go into TV? Was that always on the cards? Yeah, I mean, you know, my ex-wife Kate was an actress, it still is, and we get on really well and everything. But we've got three children together and we never pushed them into it. It's like my son George is a great guitar player. He's never really sat down and I've never made him learn things on the guitar. He's always had guitars in the house and we live in a big house and I used to just crank a marshal in the house, you know, at a big area where I could do it. And he always said when we were walking down the lane from the bus, you could hear dad's guitar, you know, from 50 <laughs> yards away. We had very understanding neighbours, I think. Going back to Emily, Emily had no formal training. She did a couple of small appearances in things before then. Her big break was she was got the in us and went from there. Because to be in all fairness, though, it wasn't like we gave her or a mum gave her a leg up. She had to still prove herself. There's only so much you can do as parents. I certainly had no contacts in that side of the business. I mean, her mum had a few, but she still had it to do. She still had to go to auditions and get things or not get things. Through her success, how do you see the industry now? Do you ever go to like an event or show and think how different it is or that there are similarities? Or do you see like, wow, I couldn't have handled this? In terms of rock music, it's gotten a little bit more cottage industry now. And that's a good thing in a way. And it's a shame in another way because... It's very difficult for bands to survive, particularly, again, you know, the tribute scene is just so strong in the venues. It's almost, it's diminished things a little bit for the bands who are making their own music. And a lot of us who do make our own music, a lot of time you have to diversify now. There's no, for instance, there's no record company advances now. There's no retainers. You've got to eke out a living while you're making art, and it still costs money. The major labels are not really focusing on the grassroots rock bands anymore. Like Tim's son, Connor, he's a fantastic drummer, but he has to work, have a day job as well. Whereas in times gone by, you would probably be retained and be under the umbrella of a, of a major label or something. You go and rehearse all week, write songs all week. Yeah, and those days are gone, though. I have to grab time a lot more than I used to be. And also, I have to diversify as a musician to make a living. I have to go on the road with different things. All I would love to do is focus solely on my own band and my own players and everything like that and I, I'm hopefully it'll get to that point if we can get out on the road find a promoter because we're looking we're still in very much in the market to find a good promoter and is there any particular tour you'd like to see yourselves get on I mean we did for instance we did a festival with Inglorious that was great for us there's some great bands out there that would be great to tour with just to throw things onto concerts do you have a concert that jumps to mind that really had a massive effect on you my early concerts that had a massive effect on me were Rory Gallagher at Leeds University when he would just had live in Europe Robin Trower I loved all Stratocaster players even bands like the Alex Harvey band you know Zal Clemenson their guitarist was awesome guitar player he's still around I think he had a band called the Sin Dogs fairly recently so he crops up now he's a fantastic guitar player a lot of those early concerts at Leeds University Doncaster Top Rank Suite stuff like that they had a big effect on me and John Parr in a pub <laughs> John Parr in the yeah in Kiko's nightclub with Bittersweet was a game changer yeah he's a lovely guy Keith, it's been fantastic to speak to you. I appreciate you taking some time. And you, Rob. It's been great. Massive thanks to Keith Atag for such great stories right here on the Straight to Video podcast. I loved hearing the John Parr stories and I can't imagine the sights and sounds he saw whilst on tour with Child and later with David Cassidy. The new album Nine Lives from Atag is available now and all information along with upcoming tour dates can be found at atagband.com. 
keep an eye on here to all things 80s video shop as there are some big changes on the way over the coming months be sure to follow all our social media channels at simply at 80s video shop and i want to also say a big thank you to everyone who checked out the new straight to video single which is our cover version of i go crazy by flesh falulu which originally featured on the soundtrack to the 1987 john hughes film some kind of wonderful i really appreciated all the great feedback and kind comments as did everyone else involved on the song and it's available on all the streaming platforms with a video on the stv youtube page so that's all for this week's podcast but i'll be back for a brand new episode in the next week so until then make sure to always be kind please rewind and unwind and i'll speak to you all real soon we